Ladies and gentlemen, this is uh, Questlove Supreme. I'm giving you guys fair warning now that if you ever complained about my uh, inside baseball method of interviewing, then you're not going to be any happier with this particular episode. However, (laughs) if if you are a uh, music head and you know your music and you know your album credits, and you know your producers and your legends, you're going to love this episode. Uh, first of all, we were just complaining that, um, you know, it, after doing those four shows together in, in New York, now we're we're back in prison again on Zoom. Pretty uh, much prison. Prison. <laughs> prison. I'm just saying. <laughs> you, you, Fonte you're in... trapped in the 60s. <laughs> yeah, I was about to say, Fonte, you're... you're uh, Currently, right now, you're back in, back in uh, North Carolina. Nah, I'm I'm. This is not prison for me. I'm actually doing quite well. Um, I know we are. <laughs> yeah, he actually Fonte made it quite clear that you know this is. He's living the dream right now. His his dream. <laughs> Yeah, man. But you know, but I but this was an episode I really did wish we could have done in person. Oh but God. If, you, this, if we would have done this in person, this episode would probably been seven hours. But, <laughs> right. You know what I'm saying? Uh how, how's it how, you you're looking well and clear today, light year. What's you gotta share your secret? Uh, I, I worked out and took a shower. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Now Baby we know that. Real simple. Like it's fresh, you know what I'm saying? Like I Steve, just did it. Bill, like, our, yeah. our two friends in the corner, you know. Am, am I looking well? Yeah, man, you look you, you look awesome, Steve. I, I put on some uh, brown coconut oils for you for this show. That's what's up, man. That's what's up. Bill, okay. how you doing? I'm great. Bill, you really missed uh, an important episode with Angie Martinez, by the way. Oh, my God. Why, why, man, we we took it back to the old school. <laughs> I feel like the ne- like we should only do the in persons and we should only do them in certain ways and I miss them. All oh, there's no it's, there's it's been day. Hey, Amen. All right. Aww. Also, we'll, I just we'll like be... hugging Fonte. I haven't. It was great, man. I haven't seen we'll, you we'll do in person forever. My microdose supreme. That'll be the the, yeah. <laughs> the renaming of it. <laughs> also, I have um, to revitalize myself. Anyway, continue. Yeah. So, ladies and gentlemen, I will say that this. Uh, I sound like a broken record. This episode's been a long time coming. This is, I feel like uh, the 45th president when he ever does those like meaningless, you know, you're about to see the likes of an episode that you've never seen before. Um, This, this episode's for me. I'm being selfish here. I'm just saying it's for me. Um, We've always wanted this gentleman, this legendary gentleman on our show. Um, as I said at the top of the show, sometimes uh, this is the joys of reading album credits and getting to know people. And, you know, I will say that this gentleman's work is is highly ubiquitous in in, in terms of, of really just being um, an important architect in dance culture and in, in soul culture and funk culture and disco culture in boogie culture in post boogie culture. Um a lot of a lot of the uh uh bands the a lot of underground groups uh, that we've danced to throughout the years throughout the decades from um uh conversion to the fantastic Aleems to uh Simpho state uh there's log oh, yeah. his own black ivory freak dazzle um Jesus Christ y'all I can't believe it we have the one and only Leroy Burgess on Quest Love Supreme. Yes, sir. <laughs> Long time coming. Shout out, shout out to uh shout out to my doctor. Uh you know, I I, I will say that um for about maybe two and a half uh years, uh uh Doc Gathers was basically like, yo, man. Libor Burgess wants to come on your show. I'm like, I'm gonna make it happen. I'm gonna make it happen. We never got to make it happen, but I'm so glad we make it. How how are you this evening? Right today's now, the day, today's the day. Mm-hmm. Today's the day. Absolutely. Today, that day is this is the time for it, and it's a pleasure and a joy to be here 
with you guys. It's, this, this seems like it's going to be a lot of fun. I can already <laughs> tell. I can already tell. Like this is going to be great because you are actually prepared with your own microphone. It's clear sound. You know, it's not like I've been in Zoom prison before. Um, so, <laughs> so yeah. you know, um, I'm used to it. <laughs> so uh, it's good to be here. Uh, thank you for having me. And thank you for uh, your interest in me and my work. Uh, uh, it's pretty cool. Thanks. You're a legend. All right. We're just going to start with the top. Uh, always start with this question. Uh, yeah. Leroy Burgess, what was your first musical memory in life? Okay. That's easy. That's really, really easy. My first musical memory when I was but a, a an infant was hearing my mother's voice. My mother mm. classically trained contralto, and she used to love to sing. And when I was born, she was singing. And given some of the things that was going on in the household and during her life, uh, she sang through those things. Uh, you know, any amount of, the regular amount of turmoil that you have in a Black family home in America back right. in the 50s. All right, you know, still that. now. Yeah, exactly. And at that time, it was five of us. I was uh, number four and the fifth was to come. But I remember her voice and I remember it being the most amazing sound and thing for me to latch on to even before I could speak. Uh, uh, and my mom let me know that when I first started learning to speak, I was singing more than I was speaking. So really, okay. <laughs> that that's my first musical memory. My mother's voice. Um, can we say that she's responsible for uh your 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 silky falsetto? Well, <laughs> my mother never really got that. All right, she didn't. I mean, she it was okay when Smokey and the moments and the Delphonics would do it and Eddie Kendrickson. But me, no, she never wanted that for me. She said, oh, your natural voice is so beautiful. <laughs> uh, you should always sing your natural. And um, at Wait a minute, but your falsetto is killer. <laughs> well, those were the days as, as it was. But uh, uh, she, it took her a minute to get used to that. And by the time she did, that's when I morphed into more natural singing. And uh, I took the, I was making the transition, uh, taking a hiatus from Black Ivy and that whole vibe and that whole, you know, slow jam thing. Uh, and moving into my dance period, my, my, my disco period. And mm -hmm. I made a conscious decision that I wanted to sing in my natural voice because that's what was happening. You know, the old days was happening and how Melvin and the Blue Notes was happening. You wasn't hearing a lot of up tempo, uh, smoky and moments, joints. you know, they were still in the slow jam joint. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, I needed to evolve and I felt I felt uh, an energy pulling me towards a new type of music or what was happening at that time. So, okay. you know, I made a conscious decision to begin singing in my natural voice. And surprisingly, it's the one that is more most internationally known. Uh, the the world embraced it while America embraces the four settle thing. Could you describe uh, the household like with your siblings and your your parents? Like a lot of our guests, especially kind of the Northeast based guests, they kind of have the, the same narrative where like they might have grown up in a church household where like secular music's not allowed or that sort of thing. Just like what was the, what was the general atmosphere of uh, your 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 family and their musical acceptance? Well, my family, like most African descended families in New York City and around the country, are spiritually based. So, yeah, church was a part of what you had to do, all right? Yeah. What you had to learn, you had to learn to have a relationship with the Almighty. 
and learn who he was. So that's what they drummed into your head. But what I liked about it was the music that you heard in church and the, and the choir and, and so forth and so on. So that locked me into that vibration. Uh, I come from initially in the early part of my life, we were five kids and um, two parents. However, my, my biological father, Leroy Jackson Sr., uh, passed away when I was six years old, and my mother remarried uh, uh, to Morgan Burgess shortly after that. Uh, so that is why I describe myself as Leroy Burgess, as opposed, okay. you know, my full my full name is Leroy O'Neill Jackson Jr. But I describe myself as Leroy Jackson Burgess because I'm I'm uh, 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 the the end the sum result of both fathers, all right? Okay. Mm -hmm. one, one actually uh, uh, conceived me and the other raised me. So I'm equal parts of their energy. Uh, we had a good house. We lived in Harlem River Projects. And uh, went. I went to PS90 about four blocks away. Uh, back in the day when you had to walk through four or five feet of snow. <laughs> you know, it, it was unheard of to close the schools on you know we a snow day was was if it was 15 feet that would be a snow day all right yeah. anything below 15 feet you know you're going to get you behind the school get you <laughs> so right uh, we had a loving family um my grandparents uh were famous for uh they built small churches up and down the East Coast, and they were the, they were the family that oh no you can't come in here with you got to come in here with Jesus and if you told him you know it's like but my mom was a little bit less strict I mean uh, she took us through church St Matthew's Baptist Church uh, in our early time mm -hmm. uh, so so the spirit you know and being connected to spirituality was always a part of of. You know, I connected it directly with music. I, they were intertwined to me. Um, so, you know, but as to, you know, growing up, it was a great time to grow up. Uh, that was back when, you know, uh, urban families, Black families, African descended families, we were very tight back in the 60s and 50s and stuff. I mean, it was just like a, a village. Uh, a, we were united in a lot of ways and we had the support of each other much more than say today. Uh, and that was one of the things being raised in that type of environment was just extremely cool. All right. So you mentioned Harlem. So um, I got to ask about just your musical memories of Harlem. Um, do you have any memories of like Bobby Robinson's record store or any yeah. early Apollo shows that you got to witness? I didn't make it to the Apollo until I performed there when Don't Turn Around came out in 1971. Oh, I, what? Knew, okay. I knew it was there. I was scared of amateur night because I seen them boo people. <laughs> <laughs> if that happened to me, it would crush me forever. And um, so uh, the very first time I performed at the Apollo, it was professionally. Don't Turn Around had come out uh, with Black Ivy. But uh I felt like I just missed the music period, you know, the Billy Holiday and Duke Ellington and Count Basie when they was all there, Louis Armstrong. I just missed it. I came, I was born in 1953. So by the time I was about four or five or something like that and could interact with my environment, they was gone. Yeah. So, so, but their energy. Their energy was still there and the, and the type of clubs and the people that they gravitated to, they were still around. And so there was a music that if you listen closely enough, you could hear it just buzzing in the streets in Harlem. You walk, you know, just walking, say, from 151st Street where I live to 145th Street and back. You'd hear all kinds of music coming from all kinds of places. And some of the coolest stuff, some jazzy stuff, some, of course, African African influenced stuff. Uh, and it was just uh, I would I would keep those things in my head and be bopping around like, <laughs> like, <laughs> like I was. You know, everybody thought I was a little bit crazy to say nothing of singing in the streets. I had no 
problem just bursting in the song, walking along. I had no problem. So they they started to know that I was the I was they called me the singer. They, oh yeah, they, they go the singer. <laughs> so you're telling me that at no point it, as a five, six, seven year old, are you ever visiting the Apollo Theater just to watch a show or to see the Apollo until I was uh, 17. Yikes. 17. I didn't get to the Apollo Theater until I was 17. Okay. Uh, um, can you, can you tell me the first record that you owned or purchased? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I can tell you the first. Well, I didn't, the one that I, the first one I purchased or the first one I got that made a difference? All right. So the, the first record that had an impact on you. Okay. And then the one that you purchased with your own money, but. This, this is a little crazy. The first record that had an impact on me was a record called Tubby the Tuba. Right. Okay. And, um. It was a great musical piece that definitively described the interaction of the orchestra, right? Something that I used to hear all the time on the Nat King Cole records and the Johnny Mathis records and so forth. And so on these great orchestras doing this great stuff. And I was like, oh, what, what part is that? And so forth. So this record, Tubby the Tuba, uh, it's a child, it's a children's story, but in within the story they explain what the string section does, or, or they demonstrate what the horn section does and what the percussion section does and so forth. I was like, oh wow, I get it now. I get it. So I could now listen to records and distinguish, pull apart the strings, pull apart the horns, so forth and so on. So the very first record that I, that influenced me profoundly was Tubby the Tube. Right, a little so seven. So, so you're getting entertained, you're getting entertained, and you're getting educated right. at the same time of how, how things work. Absolutely. All right. That's and weird because when when Songs in the Key of Life came out, uh-huh. uh huh. When you when people purchased the album back in 76, uh Stevie Wonder included like a 24 page booklet uh-huh. that that had all these album credits in it. And you know, for most black records, you know, liner notes of that of that uh caliber really weren't they weren't accessible you know so my mom would read those that to me like it was a i read every single word i was a line of no fool all right i, I see back in the days um with the johnny Mathis albums and so forth and so on mom would put on the album or dad would put on the album i was like give me that give me the cup let me read it let me see who on the back. Oh, this who's this person? And hey, who's this person? And now, you know, I kept interrupting my mother and father from listening to the music that they very much wanted to hear. But right. I'm like, oh, who's this? Who, who is this? Who, 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 who? So, but I loved reading line of notes because it told me the story of the album. And and you know, it gave insight to what how the creative process. And I was like, oh, what's an arranger? Mm-hmm. Ah. Yeah, what's in the range of what does that guy do? You know, and um, having the understanding of what the different orchestral pieces uh, did, I got my appreciation for what the rhythm pieces did from listening to jazz, all right? And then hearing that bass and oh, that's an electric piano, not an acoustic piano. How cool is that? This is the this type of style on guitar and so forth. So I got now I'm making a dis- distinction between how orchestral works with rhythm and how orchestral works with jazz and how the two of them mess together. So I'm putting all these, this is a little seven-year-old, six-year-old brain trying to put all these things together, right? And uh, when it comes, I got a lot of information from reading the liner notes, the, who the songwriter was. They, these things became important to me, who the songwriter was. Okay. Oh, that's a great song. I hear a lot of songs. There's a lot of songs, but this one song, oh, that's great. Who wrote that? Right? So paying that kind of attention to it um, uh, gave me great insight and great appreciation to the process, you know, because I needed to understand how to do it. So All right. Me- now, the the album that you purchased, what was that? <laughs> well, purchased is a Funny <laughs> oh, obtain, Fonte, you might obtain, want to ask this yeah, question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead, first record you acquired. We will acquired, say first. The first record you acquired. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's a better word. I, and uh, I kind of snuck it. And, and the first album that I 
acquired was Abbey Road by the Beatles. Wow. Wow. And, uh, I was a Beatles fan, right? And my mother sent me to Gimbals. And Gimbals? Yeah, Gimbals up, Gimbals up in the West. Um, what you know about Gimbals? Yeah, yeah, Gimbals, not Macy's, Gimbals. Gimbals, <laughs> wow. Okay. Uh, Gimbals. You talking Gimbals. my language, okay. Now, I was actually, I was going to Gimbals and I was going to the s &H Green Stamp Redemption Center to get something from the green stamp that you Those get. green stamps. Yeah, so she, my mother had books and books and books. She had the, the catalog where she got everything. So the place was up in Parkchester. I live in Harlem, so there's a couple of trains I have to take and so forth and so on. So I went up there to get her thing from, from there, pick up something from Gimbal's, and I had to stop in the record department. Right? And um, <laughs> I acquired <laughs> the Abbey Road album, and I bought it back. And I started playing it incessantly. I played everything incessantly, really. But um, I started playing it incessantly. And um, nobody really asked me, where did that album come from? Where did you get that? <laughs> uh, but, but um, you know, I that was the first album I acquired. Now, the first album I started getting into were way before that because my mother was a member of, check this out, the Columbia Record. Oh. Wait, that was out in the sixties. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, Eleven oh, for a dollar. Yeah. Like, what was it back in the day? Twelve records for a penny. Yes, Twelve sir. Wow. for a penny. As long as you, you know, you buy. <laughs> so, my mom used to. She knew I loved music, and she, like I said, she's a singer. So she was like, you know, when I was good, you know, and I've been, you know, uh, not misbehaving. Uh, she would say, okay, well, you can buy them. You can pick out one record of the 12, or you can pick out two records of the 12. So I used to get Temptations, Stevie Wonder, uh, The Supremes, uh, you know, uh, Jerry Butler mm -hmm. was one of my favorite albums, The Iceman Cometh. And uh, I used to listen to those joints. So those were the first things that I started listening to uh, in order to discover who my musical being was. Wow. Okay, wait. Now you mentioned something earlier, and I was going to let it slide, but I okay. got to know because the thing is, is that when you mention the S and H uh, green stamps, mm -hmm. probably the only memory that I have of my mother's, uh, my 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 grandmother on my mother's side, mm -hmm. is her sitting at our table with like thousands and thousands and thousands of those green what were those green like the way that next to those green stamps and um those like swedish uh cookies you know the the butter cookie de yeah. designs that the eventually Danish. become uh yeah. their storing spot for uh sewing the danish cookies danish yeah the danish cookies. uh swedish yeah. the danish cookies yeah. that after you finish, they they become like the sewing kit. The sewing kit. The sewing kit. Yeah, that that's <laughs> that's the woman's uh, crown royal bag. <laughs> so, yeah. well, what were those? What were those S and H stamps for? Here's, here's what's up. Basically, you go to the supermarket like anybody else, right? You buy X amount of groceries, right? For the money that you spend for those groceries, you would get X amount of green stamps. That and they and they would give you books that you could lick the stamps on, stick them on a page, so forth and so on. When you get your books filled up, right, and mm. you know you had X amount of books. Well, this vacuum cleaner costs five books. Now this mm -hmm. thing costs rewards. Five. They were rewards program, yeah. And yeah. and if you just had to get up there to the S and H Redemption Center and pick up what so my mom got all of these nice little because we went every time she went food shopping for the kids, she'd have like a hundred, you know, <laughs> and so she, you know, I was the I was the the designee in the family to go up there and pick up the S and H Green Stamp uh, merchandise. I was the counter. Mm -hmm. I would have to count with my she. I learned how to count oh, doing okay. those S and H Green Stamp. I never knew what they were for. I was like, I mean, that's, that's probably like one of the they, first. Free stuff. 
they, they, they were more free stuff. Stuff and stuff when it was good stuff when it was really, really free. Right. They right. didn't they did, the, the companies that supported or that donated their products to the SNH factory, you know, for them to give away. They were mm. advertising for them and promotion for them. So, but you know, you can wow. get some good I'm carpet and you know, stuff the from, game. Hey, yeah. so. You know, so yeah. Now I realize that half the items in my house must have came from S N H Green Stamps. Okay. <laughs> so when um when I, you know, I I told like some of my 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 friends and luminaries and music heads that you were coming on the show. I have to say, you're probably the most connected human being I know because the first response that every music head tells me when I'm like, yo, we're about to get him on the show. They tell me like, yo, you know, he's related to Tom Bell, right? Yo, you know, he's related to Archie <laughs> Bell, right? Yo, you know, he's related to ah, Ronald. And Ro How many? The Bells. Just the Bells, huh? So you're trying to tell me that Tom and Robert and Ronald of Cool and the Gang and Al Bell. Right. Of Stax and Archie Bell, of the you're all related. Yes. Wow. And how come no one has the put two and two? Yeah, I don't know. Listen, we don't. Yes, all... you do. No, well, here's, here's the story with that. Patty Labelle. No, 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 no. Nah. That's, That's a stretch. A stretch. A... <laughs> oh, come on, Alexander. Um, no, no, right. <laughs> I thought Patty was the stretch, but. Boy. Right, right, right. Ricky Bell? <laughs> Ricky yes. Bell. From yes. Okay. We are all de descendants of an enslaved individual named Prince Bell from the 1820s and 18, you know, 1860s, 70s or something like that. Prince Bell had a, a total of three wives. With each of his wedding, wedding unions, he made a bunch of kids. Right, those kids became my grandparents and my mom and my dad, and the same is true for Tom Bell, or the Bell brothers from Cool and the Gang, Jerry Bell from the Dad's Band, uh, Wow, Bell, Al Bell, Ricky Bell from Velvet DeVoe. Wait, um, I was only playing. That's real. Yeah. God damn! Wow, wow. <laughs> but, but this I'll is like. Outside of the Bell family, or, or Judge Mathis, Greg Mathis is a cousin, and the actor Richard Roundtree is a. All of us are descendants of Prince Bell. The Bell. I, I also heard Betty Wright as well. Betty Wright. I met Betty Wright in. Who uh, you leaving out? <laughs> are we related, Lee Warren <laughs> Right, right. Yes, we are. Well, Probably. I believe that. I believe that I'm related to everybody in the world. <laughs> I mean, well, I see why. That is that crazy. Is. Yes, yeah, so oh, shout, shout out to uh, Fire Burgess, who also, mm. I mean, you know, Fire, right? Uh, uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, player, absolutely. Yeah, Fire. Yes, absolutely. Fire yeah. Burgess, that, who that's definitely want this episode to happen. Wow, you are connected to everyone. Right. So when I think about where, you know, was it I predestined to enter the music industry, um, I, I'm kind of leaning towards feeling like that's the case. <laughs> Because uh, there's so many luminaries in my family that are, are not just in entertainment, but in music specifically, who have made a definitive mark on the industry as a whole. So I'm just bringing up the rear. <laughs> the Thomas Dude, Bell it, thing might be real, too. I'm just saying. It was predetermined. Like, your, your future yeah, was... Everyone in your family has singing talent and has pushed the envelope. That's crazy. Can I just ask who found who first? Like who when did y'all know that this was the story behind your family? Yeah. Tom Bell back in my when I was very, very young. Alexander Graham Bell. Five, four, five, and six and stuff like that. Uh he used to come to the family picnics down that we used to have uh down in Jamesburg, New Jersey. We still have them in the same place every year. Um, he used to come, and I used to follow him around like a little puppy dog, right? Because he was always talking music. That's that was. Then he stopped coming, right? Mm -hmm. uh, fast forward to about nineteen, somewhere in the nineteen nineties, the Bell 
the South Jersey Bell picnic couldn't happen. So the North Jersey Bell, the Bell Aikens picnic happened. And my mother traveled to that because I was on the road, right? That's where my mother met Cool, cool and and Robert and Ronald and all of and Kevin's mother. And she uh-huh. Son sings in music. My son sings in music. Oh, so my, my, my son is in music. Hey, oh, who's your son? Black Ivy. Who's your son? Cool again. Oh, what do you do? Right? So, wow. So that's how they, and then um, a wonderful cousin of mine that I didn't know, I met her on Facebook. Her name is Geneva Norman, right? And she asked if she was a cousin and she relayed, and then she presented me with a document, the Bell family history going all the way back to Prince Bell, right? And it contained every single, everybody in the whole family, including all my brothers, all my siblings, all my cousins, all, you know, uh, it it was just really a definitive document, 16 page document uh, that told me who everybody was and where everybody was and so forth and so on. So uh, uh, as I proceeded through life after finding that out, um, the last one that I met officially was Betty. Uh, mm-hmm. Before she was called to the Lord, when, when she was called to her ascension, I mm-hmm. met her when the National R&B Music Society was giving her uh, a Lifetime Achievement Award. And uh, I was, you know, I was uh, one, at present at that awards presentation. And um, I walked over to her after she got the award and I said, congratulations, Ms. Wright. Um, by the way, I'm a descendant of Prince Bell. And she jumped up and said, cousin, and hugged me. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh, you know, and, and, and so, you know, things like that. That's been my life uh, to to uh with Jerry Bell from uh Dad's band and formerly of New Birth. He was the lead singer of New Birth. Uh yes. I probably performed with New Birth. And mm-hmm. I believe didn't didn't he eventually join Cool in the Gang? Didn't he I believe in eighty seven when JT left uh J- J- Jerry Bell is the one that sang Let It Web him. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Yes, he Oh, that explains it. Does that it? explains it. Good. That is what, yo, because c- you don't understand when they made an album 1987 or 88. Okay. And, you know, JT had left the group. Okay. And they did an appearance on Soul Train. And Don was trying to put two and two together. Like, wait, where I know you from? Where I know you from? He said, oh, man. Corner Gang, yahoo! Now, um, Daz Band, yahoo! And that is that? wow. Okay, they're cousins. Yeah, <laughs> that is crazy. Okay, so pushing the story Pretty along because I know because I know that uh, the group started when you were young in your teens and whatnot. Um, mm-hmm. How did how did you meet with with Stuart and and Russell, your your bandmates in Black Ivory, Stuart uh, Bascom and Russell Russell uh, Patterson? Uh, we're talking about 1968, and that's when your family made. I was 14. That's the year that your mom said, "No, you're gonna go out and get you're gonna get the summer job and get start making your own money, so you can get the you know." So I got a summer job, and uh, I worked at St. Charles Bar Mail as a youth counselor for, I was a 14 year old taking care of the eight year olds, you know, that, that, that kind of thing. Right. I'm a camp. You're, you're the oldest sibling. Oh, no, 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 no. My eldest sibling is my sister, Cheryl. Uh, uh, she is, she's 73 and okay. I'm 70 in August. So I met while I was on, you know, what we were having lunch and, um, <clears throat> shooting bricks, <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, but we had a little transistor radio playing, and here I go again by Smokey Robinson and the Miracles came on. And uh, one of my co-counselors, Larry Newkirk, he started singing along with it. And 
somewhere halfway be, in between the song, I started singing along with him. And at some point he stopped, right? And just let me continue singing. And, I, you know, I closed my eyes and I just continued singing the song. And then when I finally opened my eyes, all these people had gathered around me, right? So uh, Larry said, hey, you got a beautiful voice. I said, you too. And he was like, well, I got a group. You, you interested in joining the group? I said, sure. So I went to his house, Esplanade Gardens, uh, Home 47th and uh, between 7th and Lennox, mm -hmm. and um, uh, met the rest of his group. The Mellow Souls was the name of the group. Uh, about a week later, uh, the fifth member of the Mellow Souls uh, joined uh, uh, Larry Newkirk's group. So there were five of us, right? And uh, we started rehearsing, started learning songs, Delphonic this, Moments that, uh, Main Ingredient this. Just started, you know, practicing records, right? Um, and uh, Larry's sister, Gail Newkirk, she was friends with, or oh, they were, you know, boyfriend and girlfriend with Patrick Adams. She right. Said, I can get Patrick to come. And so we were all ready to meet Patrick. And we met over Larry's house and so forth and so on. Patrick called to say he could not come. Right. Yeah. During the phone call, I was singing Can You Remember by the Delphonics, right? In the background, I was in the other room. Um, but Patrick heard it, and he asked Larry, who is that singing? And Larry was like, that's our lead singer. And so Patrick called me to the phone, asked me about, you know, blah, blah, where did you learn to sing, and where did you do, do? And I can't make it today, but can you meet me next week? And so that's a week later, we arranged a meeting with Patrick Adams, and he was enamored with the group, but he couldn't work with five people. Mm -hmm. so, so the first one to leave the group was Michael Harris uh, in educational pursuits, pursuing his further education. Uh, uh, so that made it a quartet. Myself, Vito Ramirez, Stuart Bascom, and Larry Newkirk. And we began being groomed and developed by Patrick Adams, right? Finally, they got us... Um, Here's, here's an amazing coincidence, all right? Mm -hmm. Patrick became friends with Gene Red, who was the manager mm -hmm. of Cool in the Gang. Yeah, right. right. Now, when Cool in the Gang first came out, they were an all-instrumental band. There was right. no vocals or anything. They just played, came out and jammed all these soul instrumentals that was dope, right? And, you know, people bought them and danced to them. But, and they were quite popular, doing quite well. So Patrick suggested to Gene or vice versa that uh, why don't you let my group premiere themselves you know, by singing a couple of songs being backed by a Kuna gang? And they said yes. They said yes. So we, we were given two songs, Love on the Two-Way Street and Everybody is a Star, right? That Kuna mm -hmm. gang learned and learned to play behind us to right. premiere the group, Right. Now, this is before we had any idea, me and the Bell brothers, that we were related. We right. I just knew they were Bells, and I knew that I was the son of a Bell. Right? <laughs> That's so funny. <laughs> but um, uh, so that is how Black Ivy, after a minute, uh, Larry Newkirk and Vito Ramirez left to pursue their further education and so forth and so on, leaving just me and Stuart. Mm -hmm. okay? But Larry's brother, Todd Newkirk, had was developing a group to follow behind us, Shades of Mellow Soul. In that group, the best singer was Russell Patterson. Okay. So we went, it was just me and Stuart, we went to Russell and we said, hey, would you be interested in being we're part of this nonsense going on over here. <laughs> you could just steal somebody from their group? Yeah, basically. Basically, we, we basically stole Russell. That group dissolved. And that's when Stuart and Patrick got on the phone with each other and changed the name. Mellow Souls is like hokey as hell. Like, so, <laughs> you know, the, the Mellow Souls, who doesn't, who doesn't do that? Uh, right. So, um... Uh, Patrick and Stewart got on the phone and they came up with Ivory and then Black Ivory 
you know, kind of described us because Russell and I were this complexion and Stuart was light. You know, he's a light-skinned brother. So right. that puts you in mind of the piano and piano keys and all of that. And so <laughs> Black Ivory. That's why uh-huh. y'all named yourselves Black Ivory. Oh, wow. Mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah. So, That's so- the best colorism story I've heard. <laughs> actually, speaking of which, well, like this actually came out. I, I didn't even plan this moment. But Speech right TV. at this moment, I'm watching <laughs> you guys on Soul Street. Yo, your your Shut Afro, up! your wow! Afro is highly, highly impressive. I <laughs> wow! Oh my God! First of all, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta say, you are the only person with that footage. Oh, I know. In the <laughs> world. <laughs> yeah, I realize this. I'm. We have. I can't. I cannot explain to you why I have this footage, but you guys can take a wild guess why I have this footage. But this isn't happening. <laughs> yeah, we've. Been, I've been looking. I've been looking for that footage to see that show. That this one is, performance. No. Um. Um. What goes around comes around. Yeah. Uh, Obviously, I'm working on a project, and you know, I keep the show on. Even if I weren't working on it, I'd be watching all 1,100 episodes of Soul Trick. Like, it, this just always stays on no matter what. It's like my how Aquarius. Bad. You don't know how crucial we have been looking for this that footage for over 40 years. All right? Oh. Wow. For over 40 years. The Soul Train compilation came out. And I it know. is one episode that's missing. Black Ivy and Hugh Master. No, Hugh Master Kayla. Wow. And, and, and from Chicago, uh, Don's homeboy. Uh, what's his name? Uh, you have the interview where Don, Don Cornelius. I got, I, I, I not to I, dance all over my stage. And I said, well, I couldn't help it. The music. Y'all tore it up. Yes. Yeah, uh, I, uh, oh my God. I, I got you, bro. You back over there. I want you to walk back over there. Let me see. <laughs> I got you. Let's, let's do the episode and then we shall talk. Hey, yo. Hey, yo. Jake, edit video. <laughs> I will have one of my sisters bake bread or something for you. I, you know, uh, they make good bread? What kind of bread your sisters make? I don't eat it, but I know they do it. So. <laughs> Look, the greatest gift of all. I'm telling wow. you, you you have wow. literally, you, you've done more than, trust me, you You've done enough for me to 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 violate a a minor protocol to to let you have this episode. Trust me, I Aww. I got you. I got you, man. I got you. Um, I, I only share it with Stuart and Russell. I'll tell you what. I will would I I will not publicize it or or publish it until I, I got it. you. It's on record. I, it's on record. <laughs> uh, yeah, I was like, now this part you got to take off, Jake, because I don't want BT on my ass. Like, wait, did you do what? I got you. I have you. Yeah, and I appreciate that. Oh wow! I got you. I got you. Um, uh, yo. Yay. So, can you can you basically talk about Patrick Adams, like as as a record collector, um, and especially yeah, with right. per- Perception Records? Um, you know, I I know always knew it as a jazz label. Like I know like some of the funky or Dizzy Gillespie stuff, and uh, you know, uh. Well, also Fatback, but like James Moody, like a lot of jazz artists, like weren't they? Wasn't Perception pr- primarily a jazz label? It was entirely a jazz label uh, okay. initially, and uh, they were breaking into uh, R and B and other marketplaces, which is why they found a place for Patrick because he was the voice of Harlem coming from the R and B side of things, and that's why he ended up being the A and R director. But yeah, when we went to the label, it had uh, Johnny Hartman was one of the artists on. Oh wow! Album. Right, yeah. Johnny Hartman. Uh, it was Dizzy Gillespie. He was on the label, um, but they had they had uh, they hadn't really broken out the Today label. We were the ones to really break that label open today. Okay. Right? Uh, but uh, uh, yeah, uh, Patrick was a. Uh, he became my my absolute mentor and and the guy who allowed me and and supported me in getting my focus together 
to become whatever I would become in the industry. So basically you're watching him in the studio and this is how you're getting your education or? I was stealing everything I could steal, <laughs> every little part. And I was like, how did you do that? And how did you, and he loved, he loved working with me uh, because um, he loved the ideas that I could come up with on my own. You and I was my first composition, commercial composition. I wow. Wrote that, I wrote that when I was 16 years old. Um, um, <laughs> I wrote that when I was 16 years old and Stuart came in and did the lyrics to it. Uh, Patrick loved it because I didn't even know that I was using two four timing and six four timing, and so I was just like playing something that I like. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but he was like, "Oh, that's so great, and we're going to do a record." And and we did this seven minute e epic. Yes. Of 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 you and I. That you and I, right? That 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 became the 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 thing for everybody to have. Um, but so Patrick is is entirely responsible for, um introducing me and bringing me into the the music industry uh okay you know, i i can say that unequivocally there's no one but, more was patrick was he a white guy black guy i've never seen pictures of him he's black yeah, he's oh, okay black. word up all right for um for our listeners out there that are hip-hop heads um Q -tip. you and i is the sample to uh q-tips uh getting up right yeah getting up was yeah. was that was that shocking for you to hear it have a, a somewhat of a resurrection of sorts? Q Q Tip is just a a really cool brother. He's yeah. just straight up above board, all right. And what happened was, uh, I was working for working at Manny's Music on Forty Eighth Street for a little while. Okay, make ends meet. And yes, Q Tip actually came in and sought me out, right, and said, "I want to, I'm." I'm thinking about using you and I for, you know, what for this new song. Right. And uh, I want to do it the right way. So I knew I found out that you were working here. All right. You put me on to your publishers so that we can work out a licensing deal. Right. And um, I always respected him for doing that because there's so many underhanded ways you can, you know, yeah. you right. Know, decided to have the integrity to come straight at it and to do the right thing and i always respected kamal for that okay um, uh but yeah uh he well, actually came and 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 did the right thing by us so by putting two two together um can i assume that you guys' decision to record don't turn around in philadelphia at sigma sound had to do with your uh, your 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 cousin Tom <laughs> Bell also working out of there. First of all, Patrick and Tom Bell had a rivalry to you know it was New York versus Philly, the mm. New York sound versus the Philly sound. Patrick right. was the New York sound. Uh, Tom Bell was the the one of the leading catalysts of the Philadelphia sound. They became friends, so forth and so on. They knew each other professionally, and uh. Patrick was always trying to create great records and great songs like Don't Turn Around. When he became the pre um the vice president of the A and R at at uh Perception Today, they gave him the budget to go to Philly and use, I think we used uh half of MFSB. Yeah, Norman Harrison, Vince Montana, like all the cats. Right. All and the dudes. The other half of the band, of the rhythm band, was Willie Feaster and the Mighty Magnificence. Right. Okay. Right? Which was the all platinum Stang Records. Yes, the 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 Sylvia Robinson crew. Right. Yeah. So I was going to ask, how did you manage? Because when I read read the album credits, I'm like, wait a minute, is is this all just a tri-state thing, or like were? Because I think for a lot of us, when we think of the Philly sound, we literally think that everything is going through Gamble and Huff, and it really wasn't until. One day, Joe Tarsia told me, like, no, like, you know, there's a period where even the MSF, MFSB cats broke away from Gamble and Huff as session musicians and decided to produce themselves. But since they recorded at Sigma, you know, it all sounded the same because of the, of you know, the equipment they used. And, and the style, yeah, just the style of the music there. They all right. did so, 
Yeah. So people didn't feel a certain way. Like I would think that like Gamble and Huff would feel a certain way if you know Dexter Wanzell or 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 Vince or whoever is like at the helm or even your your cousin. Like it all sounds the same because it's the same musicians, the same engineering, the same studio, the same instruments. So I'm just thinking like this is all going through Gamble and Huff. But cast them feel a certain way about like. Well, here's my best answer to that. Um, it began as a partnership, uh, Gamble, Huff, and Bell. All right, the three of them were together. That's where you get um, uh, Mighty Three Music and so forth. And so I did okay. Yeah. I didn't realize that Bell was like a part of there. I just thought he was like, right. "Hey, I use this studio as well." I didn't realize that. No, he now was, see where Mighty Three came from. An integral part of the gamble when they all was in their twenties and stuff like that, they worked together, right? The Ice Man cometh with an album produced by Gamble and Huff and Bell. Okay, um, one of my favorite songs, "Are You Happy," completely arranged by Bobby Martin and Tom Bell. All right, uh, so um, they were always connected, and then as that as as music evolves. They became Kenny and Leon, and then Tom Bell went off and did his Delphonics thing, right? While Kenny and Leon did the Intruders, and, you know, that became the early OJs and so forth and so on. So, and mm -hmm. next thing you know, Tom Bell is doing the Spinners, and, you know, that whole, that whole sphere. But, yes, indeed. Every time they went into the studio, whether it was Gambling Huff or Tom Bell, they'd use the same musician, Norman Harris, um, um, Earl Young on drums all the time, Vince Montana. They right. were all these same cats, and they all had this a like style of composition, all right. Where whereas Gambling, the songs that they wrote were similar. They they came from the kind of the same place, all right. And then using the same musicians to realize these songs creates that specific sound, the Philly sound, right? Which can come from either Gamble and Huff or Tom Bell and later on Dexter Wanzell, um, mm -hmm. and Bad and Whitehead, so forth mm -hmm. and so on, the various offshoots, uh, uh, Norman Harris, Baker Harris Young, so forth and so on, and the Vince Montana camp. They were all united in Sigma Sound Studios, and they would call each other up for the various sessions. So that's why all the records started sounding like each other. Thank you for finally saying that. <laughs> I I just never knew. Yeah. Right, and, spit, and talk to all of them. Sorry, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm not, now, I was uh, going to ask before we uh, got off the first album, uh, I keep asking you questions. Yeah, um, uh, yeah uh, Wu-Tang. Uh, how, how did it feel when you heard that? you know, being used in, in that way for criminology. <laughs> Same story as Kamal. Yeah, I don't think so. Or no. <laughs> or, or no. Or no. I heard him laugh. I heard him laugh. I'm like, all right, I don't think this is going to be the same. Because I, I can't wait to get to over like a fat rat because yeah. I get the feeling that this, <laughs> this is all like after the fact. Yeah. I didn't know about criminology until way after it came out and was successful, right? And my first response was the old R&B head, right? Mm -hmm. Oh my God, mm -hmm. this rap is taking over. And <laughs> right. You know, they, I don't know, what are they saying to the kids? And so forth and so I went Mr. T on everything. <laughs> <laughs> so, I was like, but then it was doing so well, and then it, it, it went gold, and then it went platinum. Chiching. Well, I might be okay with this. <laughs> <laughs> I might just be okay with this, and I actually am looking at the platinum plaque right there. I um, love it. Um, <laughs> only for, built only for Cuban links. Uh, I, he yeah, I was going to say for a lot of us, I mean, yeah, my dad had your records, but it is those records that made us really, truly like revisit those records and look yeah, at the album credits way. and then just really get lost in your history. So 
I, I know in the beginning it's a little jarring because you're like, oh, my work's being torn apart or whatever, but <laughs> you know <laughs> that if there ever was an album for you to be associated with, that was the record. Man. Well, that started a trend and a trend which had uh, begun earlier uh, by uh, uh, I think it was um. Uh, remember Strictly Business, that movie? Mm -hmm. The movie, yes. yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, Grand Pooba, Grand Pooba, he took Grand fat Pooba, rat. He used over like a fat rat. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like, I was I was not cool with it until I saw the first check. <laughs> and, and you I, realized, yeah. That makes I was sense. very cool with it. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I, I have a question about, well, for you, when would you say is the moment that you graduated from just songwriting and singing to like really like at the helm of, of production where, where Patrick sort of taking a back seat and now this is a Leroy Burgess production. Okay. That's easy too. That's an easy one. The transition moment, the actual transition moment when I be, when I transitioned from composer and musician into mm -hmm. producer arranger was the weekend album, the freak album. Yeah. When Patrick, okay. uh, at, I had stepped away from Black Ivy, we took a hiatus from Black Ivy and participating with them. Uh, and the first person I went to was Patrick. And Patrick used to work me out, uh, worked on the Benny King album, art. Art, art web album, you know, just background vocals or keyboards or something like that, you know, stuff like that. Then mm -hmm. he said, I got this album, Atlantic's giving me a project called Free, and I need two songs, right? And I had one song called Weekend and one song called Much Too Much. And he said, okay, but you're going to write all the charts. You're going to, you're going to write, all, he said, I'll do the strings, but I want you to do the horns, right? I want you to do all the synths, and I want you to teach the rhythm musicians, which is something that I learned from teaching my band a band of songs, you know, the Black Ivy Band, the songs, mm -hmm. how, how to play, and how I wanted them arranged. So I had a, a, a back, but this was the first time I started writing charts and, you know, having to do that. Wow. So that was the actual transition because when I went in the studio to do it at you at uh, Bob Blank Studios, uh, I was I was waiting for power. I went in there. Waiting for Pat. Here's the, here's the charts. Good luck. And he was like, No, 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 no. This is you. Go in there with the musicians, right? Show them the song. Give them the parts that you want them to play, right? You're gonna. I'm gonna play acoustic piano. You play electric piano, right? And this is how we're gonna do it. And he said, You're at the helm. I want this to be what you want, all right? So you're gonna come up with the parts. All I'm gonna do is the strings. <laughs> And I was like, okay. So that was me actually stepping, crossing that threshold into production and arranging and so forth. That was, it was that moment. How okay. did you learn? I wonder, oh. how did you learn to like read music and play? Were you just playing by ear or were you formally trained? And are these chord charts or like noted notes? Yeah. The first, <laughs> okay. To answer your question, Chris, um, they are chord charts, all right? Okay. Patrick, was, Patrick taught me how to write the chord charts, right? He would later teach me how to write the horn charts and write for strings and to do full arrangements. So that's how that transitioned. What was your question, Bubba? Oh, I was asking, how did you learn to play? Were you, like, formally trained, or did you just learn to play by ear? Nothing was formal. Uh, I started playing when I was four years old, you know, playing with the church. But I don't call I call that banging on the piano. I was banging <laughs> on the piano. Okay. Uh, when I was very young, my mom used to get me away from my sisters. So she sent me to a babysitter that had a piano. But right? she taught me little things like Twinkle Twinkle Little Star and this old man, he played one, right? And how to play those on the piano. And that got me interested. Uh, fast forward to when I was 11, uh, I had a brilliant music teacher in the person of Herbie Jones. Herbie Jones was Duke Ellington's chief rhythm and brass arranger. Oh, wow. And, okay. 
and he worked on um he his his side job was working at the cadet corps of central harlem my mother father insisted i join the cadets so i would worry <laughs> i'd be on top of him oh how did you play that and he taught me how to play chords, how to recognize notes, so forth and so on, so forth. Now combine this with what I was learning from Patrick in terms of the specifics of reading mm -hmm. and writing and notating and so forth and so on. And I gradually learned how to do it all, uh, but it was a gradual thing. It wasn't a, I went to Juilliard or I went right. to- Right, gotcha. So, you know- uh, Okay. I I want before we. I just want to go back to you and I. Just before we forget it, mm -hmm. Larry Blackman. We had him on the show. He, That's right. Yeah, he's playing drums on that. Do you remember that session? Uh, yes, I do. <laughs> um, he on the "Don't Turn Around." First of all, the only songs that we did in Philly was "Don't Turn Around" and "I Keep Asking You Questions." Those two songs, which was uh -huh. our A and B side of our first single, right? Everything else on the on the on the Don't Turn Around album, we recorded in New York at Blue Rock Studios, right? Larry Blackman happened to live in my housing complex, Drew Hamilton Houses. I lived in building like 200 West 143rd. He lived down the block on the 8th Avenue building, right? Patrick knew him. I didn't know that Patrick knew him, but Patrick knew him, right? So when Patrick was putting together the arrangement for you and I, so forth and so on, he said, I said, well, who's going to play the drums? And he was like, well, this guy, Larry Blackman. I'm like, who? He's like, Larry Blackman. <laughs> and and, and um, he said, well, he's really good. Um, at, at he's, he's the perfect guy. So um, Larry played on You and I. Uh, and he played on Find the One Who Loves You. Mm -hmm. And he kept, played on She Said That She's Leaving. Those three songs. Wow. Oh, got it. Thank you for that. All right. So I have a production question to ask you, like, how are you able to develop your sound? Because, you know, I mean, next to the Randy Mullers of the world and, and later the Kashifs, like you're doing some really revolutionary in disco and post disco music. But I would assume that you would have to have a lot of hours to figure out what the sound is and like, so how are you able to to develop your sound like that? Well, meaning no disrespect, absolutely. You're overthinking it a little bit. I get accused of that a lot. Wow. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, not on I this show. Not it. never, not oh, ever, God. never. Man, I know. Overthinking. What? <laughs> this what? this always happens on the show. Hit I'm me. shocked and aghast. <laughs> <laughs> Appalled and amazed. You know what I mean? <laughs> the question. Um, I surrounded myself with great people, great musicians who are very simple, but do a really good job. Now, in the case of Let's Do It, um, Let's Do It was composed as an afterthought for the most part. Wow. Right? We, we were not supposed to be in, we were hired to record another song. Uh, I forget, I, I even forgot the name of that song. It was just, we were just hired as musicians, right? Mm -hmm. and, uh, but Greg Carmichael, who was the producer, he had booked 12 hours. We got through the first song, you know, the song we needed that we were booked to do uh, in two and a, two hours, two and a half hours, something like that. So he said, well, I'm not doing anything else with the time. Why don't you guys come up with something and I'll let y'all record what you want to do. So we ordered some food, right? And um, uh, while we waited for the food, I went into the the instrument room and started twinking on the piano, right? And um, usually it doesn't take but a minute for my brother James Calloway on, to come in on bass. So came up with something just very simple. So then James came in and he played on top of me playing that, right? Mm -hmm. and Sonny came in and he played on top of me playing that. You know, so the three of us were playing and arrived at that groove, right? After that, we basically laid the whole thing down. One thing that I liked about it is because uh, I like to come up with jazz changes for a disco song which because they don't belong there. You know, transitions and so forth and so on. Um, so once I had everything together, we went in, we did the rhythm. And um, uh, 
uh, as we once we had the rhythm track all all in there, then Sonny, my cousin Sonny Davenport, he started laying percussion pieces. The conga first, mm-hmm. bongo second, uh, a go go, the famous a go go, electric mm-hmm. tambourine stuff like that, right? While we called uh, uh, my sister Renee, uh, my girl Dorothy Terrell, and a couple of other females to come in and do the background. We wrote the words that night. Right? Oh, wow. We came up with the rap that night, right? So within the remaining eight hours, we came, we, we, uh, where we started with nothing and we ended up with, let's do it. Right. I always wanted to know how you came up with all the names for your, like your aliases, like law, conversion, like where did that come from? I didn't come up with them. Oh, uh, okay. <laughs> most of the time, uh, these, it would be a matter of me saying, well, I don't want it to be me. I don't want it to be a Leroy Burgess record. All right. This is a group effort, so forth and so on. And uh, initially the name of the group was Caliber, which is an anagram of Leroy Burgess and James Calloway, right? Ah, okay, okay. okay. Caliber, and that's on your limbs hooked on your love record, right? Uh, that's the only time we used that. After that, it was like as long as we retained the sound, I didn't care what name we used, <laughs> right? So I, I, I leave it to the record companies to come up with. Sam Records came up with conversion. We was like, oh, that's conversion. That is great. <laughs> uh, when he when he copyrighted the name Conversion and Salso Records wanted that group, they were like, "Well, you can't use the name Conversion." So what? would I said, well, "I don't care. We'll call it whatever." They called it Log, right? Wow. And from there, Universal Robot Band came out of that. Yes, yes. Ah, barely breaking even, man. Um, but- and from that, you know, the names just evolved from different places. I never really. My, what was important to me was that the sound and the team was doing the same thing and arriving at this style of music that we hope would be embraced. Yeah. So one of my favorite records of yours, I, just, I always wanted to ask you about, 100% by Caprice. Okay. What about it? Do you remember cutting it? Like, who's singing lead on that record? Because it sounds like a little girl. It sounds like a kid. But <laughs> I mean, but I, I, I love that song, man. It's one of my favorites in your catalog. Um, but, just, but, I'm making it. Um, Jackie Bradley used to play guitar for the Black Ivory Band and one of the early bands that we worked with. He was part of the Soul Severe's our band, right? Fast yeah. forward to about the 80s. This is that's in the early 70s, right? So fast forward to the 80s, and Jackie is putting together his own band, Caprice. He comes to me, says, uh, I would like for you to give us a song. Or if you got a song, we'd like to do a song of yours, right? So I'm like, okay, we got a song, me and Sonny had composed called 100%, right? And so we actually went into the process of teaching them. The singer, Yvette Davis, was, this was like her first record. So she wow. was very, very, oh, she was tentative. She was scared. It's green, yeah. She was, she was, she, she was like, I, she didn't believe in her voice and so forth. And I was like, no, honey, you just trust me. I, I, I'll get you to, just trust me and I can get you to, to I can introduce you to the singer that's within you. How so, old was she at this time? She was in her 20s. She was in her oh, wow. 20s or 30s or something like that. Okay. And um, so I walked her through uh, how to sing it. Because she really has a voice that like, uh, has a quality like Denise Williams, right? That really lilting, tiny, you know, it's like, you know, but at, at certain points, she can be very powerful. But, you know, it's just this lilting quality. And I said, we can use that. Let's use that that quality. And um, that's when she goes, and now is the time, don't you know? Let all of the best of time. Yes, sir. Um, uh, she was perfect for it. I made everybody get out of the studio while she cut the leaves. All right? The only ones that was there was, my, was myself and Sonny and Yvette and the engineers. Um, because I didn't want her intimidated by the other band members and so forth and so on. But uh, she did a, a, an amazing job um, in realizing that song. Okay, so since you just dropped your process, and especially with your aliases, 
Can I assume that the um the Bumblebee Unlimited song is just the Aleems on very speed? Well, it's actually not the Aleems. Um, Bumblebee Unlimited would usually be Patrick, myself, and and yeah, very speed. Just very speed is down and. What, what was the? What was the? What was the? All right, I, I don't want to be Captain Overthinking again, but. <laughs> Uh, wasn't uh, that a no 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 it's but here's the thing though it's creative as hell but wasn't that a little risky in terms of like hey this the song might actually get some traction on radio and whatnot like do we want to sing it in very speed or in our natural voices like what made you want to do that well bumblebee unlimited was patrick's brainchild right? okay and the whole thing is at that point i was desperate for work because i had just left black ivory so I needed work so bad. So whatever Patrick wanted to do, I was like, yeah, I'm fine with that. Um, uh, <laughs> I was more worried about it being us having a problem with Ross Bagdaz Bag Bagdazarian Productions and <laughs> because of, of Alvin and the Chipmunks. And, yeah. it, you know, compared because <laughs> it was the same process, this is exactly right. the same process. But Patrick said, "Don't worry about it. I'll call the bumblebee, and nobody will be the wise, will be the wiser." So, so you you really thought somebody would come at you for because Stevie Wonder did on maybe your baby and slot. Like I'm just realizing now that side one of Fresh, uh, that entire side one, Sly singing in Barry speed. I did not know that. Yeah, I I just I discovered it like a month ago. Like, wait a minute. This entire side is various. I mean, it's not extreme various speed where it sounds like Alvin and Chipmunks. He he actually when when they did the French version of Dance to the Music, uh, he he pulled a he pulled the Leroy Burgess. He didn't call it Sly and the Family Stone. He called it the French Fries, and <laughs> they kept they kept the same musical backdrop as Dance to the Music, but they sang it as Alvin and the Chipmunks. Uh, and it was really lollygagging or whatever. It's like a rare B side, and uh, yeah, for Europe. But yeah, I always wanted to know. I love that song. Um, before I get to my next question, okay, just in general with New York and uh, various bands around. Now we mentioned, you know, brother uh, Larry Blackman before, but you know, around this time, um. You know, and I, I mentioned Larry Muller and the stuff that he was doing with BT Express and with uh, mass production. Are you at all having interactions at all with like, you know, like with Larry Muller and uh, uh, or Kashif also came from BT Express a little later. But, you know, as you guys are kind of molding and shaping. uh really the sound of disco and, and more importantly, the sound of post disco. Uh, what we, I guess we call it boogie. I don't know if you call it a boogie or not, but people have tagged it boogie. Are you having any interactions with those guys whatsoever? I met Randy at a, at a little gig we did at a club called APT back in the early wow. 2010s. Uh, uh, and we're friends. Uh, same thing with Hubert Eves the third, And... Uh, yeah, uh, uh, I'm friends with all of them. We have not interacted professionally to collaborate on any music, but we appreciate where each other's coming from. So who, I mean, some some credit now, Rogers, some, who do you feel is the person that really is the proprietor of Bookie? Like a slowed down version same disco pulse, but less less cluttered and more groove based. In other words, more for the backyard barbecue than Studio Fifty Four. Like, well, if you ask anybody in London, they would tell you it's me. Um, I, I say it's you as well. <laughs> yeah, well, straight up. I I don't know. It, I just come from Harlem, right? In Harlem. While disco is like kind of up and 120, 120, right. like you know, get your heart rate going and so forth. I'm I'm from that 
chill, boom, chill, mm -hmm. boom, chill, 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 boom, 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 boom. I'm there, right, in terms of where I want to create and where the groove is for me, right? right. So when I did songs like Fat Rat and when I created Let's Do It and so forth, that's where we at. We swinging right there. We're not interested in boom, 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 boom. Now, we we do these records for record companies who, in their brilliance, uh, in, in their moments of genius, they decide, all right, let's take it and give it to somebody. Tell them to speed it up. Disco speed. <laughs> mm -hmm. Add the disco to it. Um, but as far as Boogie is just a chilled out, laid back kind of groovy joint, all right, where you can still party hard to it without, you know, having a cardiac arrest. Right. <laughs> yeah. A two step. Yeah. Well, wait, wait, let me play. let me ask him about. So for me, a song. Uh, why was Sweet to Me ever considered like a single from from the log record? On the log album, Sweet to Me, so sweet. That's like I go heavy on that song when I do my boogie sets. And I always wanted to know why wasn't that ever like given the single treatment? Well, because it, the, the the hierarchy, Ken Care, Stan Care, um, at South Soul Records, uh, they decided that the only well, there would be two singles. There would be uh I Know You Will, which was the Larry Levan record. Right. Um, you've got that something, right? Mm -hmm. And then um dancing into the stars, right? The others laid on the line, um, sweet to me. Mm -hmm. uh, they never really made it into the forefront of of being a single uh, in terms of Salso's feeling or what they decided to do. So, so they um, just felt it was filler. Yeah, they felt it was filler. But here's the big story. That about, is crazy. But here's the big story about that. We mentioned Universal Robot Band, right? Yes, sir. Better break it even. <laughs> Barely Breaking Even is actually the seventh song from the Log album. Oh, uh, okay. Gotcha. All right. Barely Breaking Even, we recorded to close the Log album out. All right. That's when we got all of the musicians, all of the singers who were put together the Log project. We called them all in the studio for, I think it was an 18 hour session or something like that. Right. Mm -hmm. Everybody was, you know, we fed everybody, made sure everybody was comfortable. It was plenty of stuff to smoke. And, you know, we was, you know, it was the happy session. And I said, mm -hmm. we're going to do this great record where everybody's going to sing and it's going to be like this giant quiet. And, and we're all going to talk about how hard it is to keep money in our pocket, barely breaking even, right? What happened was our co-producer, Greg Carmichael, heard the record and was very pleased with it. Mm -hmm. Right, and decided to go to South Soul to get a little extra paper. A little extra paper. I want a little extra. Can't care. Said no. Greg said, in the middle of the night, around two thirty in the morning. Right, he went to the studio. Air was recording, and he told him, "I want to make a safety of the master of the twenty-four two-inch twenty-four track. I want to mm -hmm. make, it, and I'll bring it right back." That later that day we went to mix the song, to do a final mix of, of the song to complete the album, and found it not to be there. So of course we're like, oh my god, what the hell? How, how did y'all let it go? All right, and so we get on the phone. We can't care. So also we coming down there right now. Greg took the tape. Blah 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 blah. We expected Ken Care to be completely up in arms about the loss of barely breaking even. Right, mm -hmm. that's when Ken told us about. Well, Greg came and was looking for extra paper, so forth and so on. I did not want to give it to him, and that's why he, you know, commandeered the tape. Right, essentially, the outrage that we expected from Ken Kier was not to be found. All right, he his basic position was: we've already got these six great tunes. <laughs> <laughs> I don't need the 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 extra of 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 you know so 
that's when uh, some months later it was released on Moogle Records as Universal Robot Band. But that Barely Breaking Even is the seventh song from the Log album. Okay, That's amazing man! Wow, um, we we uh, I didn't want to skip it. We didn't talk about Mainline. That's another one of my favorites in your catalog. Uh, but you tell us about recording that session. Um, <laughs> I stepped away from Black Ivy because we were being typecast into a slow jam group. All right, that's where you know, don't turn around, you and I, I'll find a way. All the slow jams that they love with the falsetto, they wanted us, to, the audience wanted us to stay there and thereby would not accept us doing any fast tunes. I could not stay in that environment because I was not growing creatively while the marketplace was growing around me. So that's when I made a decision to actually step away and do a hiatus from Black Ivory, all right? About Somewhere around 78, 79, Lenny Adams, who was still managing Black Ivory, came to me and said, um, I need songs for this new Buddha album, you know, or they're going to drop us from Buddha. Mm -hmm. right? And um, I said, well, I got three songs that I'm not doing anything with. Uh, Hustling, Coming Down, and Mainline. And I will, you know, those songs are, are not assigned to anybody. Uh and so Lenny was like, write your own ticket or whatever you want, whatever you need it to be. I want you to come back, bring the musicians in. All right. Uh, I said, well, if I'm going to do it, we have to do it with Patrick Adams. We need Patrick Adams on it. Um, we need James Calloway, uh, you know, and, and we just locked it up, lined it up. Um, uh, I gave them a demo so Russell could learn to sing the lead, right? And, uh, you know, the backgrounds we just sang as we normally would do, but I kind mm -hmm. of record, right? And um, Patrick came in, did the strings and horns. The drums weren't right. Initially, we used Leroy and Mike Connor on the drums, but they were not falling right. So we had Earl Young come in and overdub his. Oh, wow. wow. Okay. Earl Young. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Hypothet hypothetically speaking, so say if I'm like one of your peers or your contemporaries in 1979 and I'm producing the same music that you're producing. Okay. What would what is a producer's rate in in 78, 79, 80? Like in the in the era of 12 inch discos for the South Souls of the world, these small labels of the world, like what would my living be per per side? Like, is it whatever you can work with or is it, you know, is it uh, a contracted thing? Like, mm -hmm. how does one make a living? <laughs> Barely. Uh, <laughs> uh, basically, back in, in that period, uh, Quest, back in that period, you do good if you could get <clears throat> a budget that was anywhere between say about 3500 to about 5000 the the high end of that would be 10000 right right and the, we would give you that right and say bring me my record bring me a great record bring me something that I, that's going to kill so forth and so on and it was your job to take the amount that you were given and create that record Right. And whatever was left over, yeah, you could walk home with, you know. So if you were given ten thousand dollars and it only cost you six to do, right, you yeah. know, to get the final record, then you walking home with four. Right. Uh so budgets around that time were about, you know, if they were reasonable, they were ten thousand and up per song. Okay. Right? And that and that would give you uh a decent amount of room and how you lived and how you lived off of it is how you could make that budget um work with under ten thousand dollars so that you had to <laughs> you weren't balling out of control okay so all right so um did you have great relationships with larry levan or even frankie crocker at that like um a being song or a being a song or like bringing them a test pressing and see if it works. It doesn't work. 
Right. Are you able to go back and readjust if it does not work? First of all, I'm going to take one person at a time. Larry LeVan, all right? Yes. I did not know who he was, and I did not know who what the Paradise Garage was. I thought it was a garage. Wait, what? <laughs> wow. How did you create a soundtrack for a generation that did not know what the Paradise Garage was? I did. I'm just being honest. So what I, place, what was the, what was the epicenter of a place where you wanted to see how your music worked? Studio 54. Oh, uh, he just went straight to them. Yeah. And that's where, that's where my first gig at any of those clubs down there, long before I learned about Paradise Garage, my first gig was at Studio 54, uh, performing wow. Let's Do It. Uh, wow. But, um. Uh, as far as Larry LeVan goes, uh, I got to appreciate his art after I Know You Will was given to him to mix, right? Okay. And I was like, now, you know, we're from uptown. We're from Harlem. And we're like, we're, we're belligerent about everything. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> so um, we're like, Larry LeVan's mixing it. Who? We never heard of him. I don't know if I want him to have my stuff. Who is that? All right, so we storm Right Track Studios on 48th Street where he's doing the final mix. Right. And when I say we storm, we jump in the cab, me, James, and Sonny. Y'all from Harlem. Yeah, yeah, we jump in the cab. We rolled all the way down there, and um, we were like, um, oh, no, you letting us in this session. This is our song. All right, blah, blah, blah. So we basically bogarted our way up to the studio where he was working. And, you know, they wouldn't let us in. They wouldn't let us in. Finally, Larry came out and was gracious and said, oh, these are the producers. These are the songwriters. Let them in, so forth and so on. And then he apprised us of what he had in mind and how he was working it. And it sounded so great, right? We was like, oh, by all means, go right ahead. <laughs> so remixing was just a, a foreign idea, like letting someone borrow your stems or whatever. Your 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 mate, your your lifeline. Right. Well, here's the thing: when you were budgeted by a record company, right? It was their it was their property. Period. All right, it was theirs. So. You could do whatever mix you wanted to do and say, this is the mix I want to come out. And they'd be like, okay, yeah, let's leave it here. <laughs> <laughs> and um, then they would call Chef Petty Bond, John Morales, oh, uh, yeah. Larry LeVan. they call whoever, the, their guy, right? Jelly Bean Benitez. they call that. them and they say, hey, take this multi-track and give me a great record, right? And then mm -hmm. it would not be what the producer's vision was. It would be this other vision that w was in the mind of the remixer, however that mind might be on that given day. All right? right. But that was the job. I mean, you you wasn't, if you didn't own that master, so you couldn't say, mm. hey, I'm, so, I'm going to make sure this person makes it. They own the master. So they could say, mm. I let, and so at, after a minute, you have to say, uh, you have to resign yourself to, to that dynamic, all right? Uh, one of the cases that it's really definitive is Let's Do It. Let's Do It was an 11-minute song uh -huh. right? that had two bridges, right? Oh, wow. And the vamp chorus, I was going nuts on as a lead vocalist, right? All of that ended up on the cutting room floor at Sam Records. They was like, no contain the record to this five minute thing and this is what it's going to be we heard it we were disgusted we were like oh my god where's the rest of the record right <clears throat> let's do it came out amazing hit huge ass hit right <laughs> so uh in 2016 um uh i had a copy of the 11 minute version right right all right with the vocals and so forth and so on and uh, Frankie Knuckles played it at Studio 54, right? And I forgot to get the tape back from him. So he took it back to Chicago with him, right? Uh. 
after Frankie passed away, he gave it to another DJ, DJ um, uh, Emmanuel something, right? Um, and he gets in touch with me 2015, says, I have the 11-minute version of Let's Do It. I'm like, what? So he sends it to me. I send it to my partner, PL, to master it, right? And then to initiate the, the startup of Gorgeous Entertainment, I said, let's just put it out for free. Let's give it to everybody for free, right? And we introduced everybody to what the full version of Let's Do It is, right? And they got wow. to hear the second bridge. They got to hear the second chorus. They got to hear the vamp out. All, all of the things that were removed from it, they got to hear it. And they was like, oh, my God, this is incredible. Why did you know? <laughs> Everybody started asking the questions that we were asking. You know, why did y'all chop it up like that? Yeah. Um, so, so. I put it all down to how music evolves and the business that uh, that pertains to it, right? You know, and and just not to let anything drive you so crazy that you doing crazy stuff. I wanted to ask you about Fonda Ray. Um, she was like one of my favorite singers of that time. She yeah. was leading on over like a fat rat. What was she like in the studio? She was pleasant. She was she was um professional. And where did she come from? I don't know. A, a okay. book. No, so she was just brought to you as a client. She came from she came from um either it's either um Mount Vernon or New Rochelle or somewhere Yonkers or something like that. I think that's where she lives. Um uh when we did Over Like a Fat Rat, we recorded it as a demo with Bob Blank. He Bob Blank gave, gave us some free studio time. And uh, we, me, James, and Sonny, we went in and we just did our thing, creating songs and so forth and so on. So over like Fat Rat was one of the songs. And then we left the tapes with Bob. And then Bob went to Vanguard and Vanguard had signed Fonda. And Bob called us up and said, would we mind if he, he tried Fonda Ray? And I'm like, Fonda who? And he's like, Fonda Ray. <laughs> and I'm like, uh, Okay, well, we'll allow it if you let us be at the session. Uh, meaning myself and my cousin Sandy Davenport. Uh, we went to the session. She she learned the song and sang it very competently, giving us the performance that y'all are familiar with. Yeah. And, um, um, Was that her first session? No, she had. Done I wasn't her first one. She's also on. Uh, she had worked with uh, August Darnell. Uh, uh, oh, during the she did. Uh, she did Deputy Love. Uh, it was. It wasn't Dr. Buzzers. It was what Don Armando's second rumba band or something. Wow. Like, he always had like, that crazy like alias and stuff. But Deputy Love is a record though. That's, that's, that's a jam. Did not know that. She also had worked with uh, Patrick Adams with a version of Touch Me All Night Long. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's different than the one that we know or? A different, the, the, a version where it's spelled T U C H. Oh. Right, it's spelled T U C H me. And she did that um uh before it got to the Sandy person that did it. Okay. Wow. All right. Here's here's the question I always wanted to know. I'm I'm giving right to Rick James right now. <laughs> I knew it was coming. <laughs> so I have one question to ask you. All right, the way that you're holding your head right now, <laughs> I already know what the answer is, but can can I can I just take a wild guess that your involvement with Big Time is just that intro? No. Oh, so you did the entire because the the thing is is that that the 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 kick drum piano intro is such a Leroy Burgess sound, and then right when the song kicks in, I mm -hmm. felt like, wow, okay, now it sounds like Rick James. How how did that come? How did that come together? Okay. At the session I was telling you about where we recorded over like a fat rat for a fonda or right. we made a demo for that. One of the another one of the songs that we done was a song called Big Time. Right? Mm -hmm. Now, you know, I did the demo with the piano and James on bass and Sonny on drums. And I sang in the, you know, I did a demo of the of, of the vocals and shit. Right. And um on our way uptown, Bob Blank's studio was on 20th and 6th Avenue, right? 
And on our way back uptown, we decided to stop at 57th Street between 8th and 9th Avenue to stop at Kenny Morris's house. Kenny Morris was Patrick's partner, right? To stop there to get a little package for us to feel good with when we got uptown. We <laughs> Wink. Absolutely. So, you know, and Kenny was holding. So we went there. All right. When we got there, Kenny's friend, Rick James, was in attendance. He was he was visiting Kenny. And oh. So, you know, we really wanted to do our business and get on. But then, you know, Kenny was like, come on inside. And Patrick was right there. And, and um, uh, so we did our little wine and dine thing. I mean, well, not no dine, there's wine. We already know. <laughs> <laughs> And Rick James was like, uh, tell oh, Patrick, I'm getting ready to do my new album. I don't want more down to drop me and so forth. Because I, I just need to be a good one and so forth. And um, I mentioned that we just came out of the studio doing a little demo and so forth. Oh, let me hear it. Oh, oh, let me hear it. I, I'm looking for songs. Right? And so Big Time was the first song on the cassette. And we only made it halfway through. We, oh my God, that's my song. That's my song. I got to have it. Got to. Uh, because Big Time is the persona of Big Time is Rick James persona. It's all about a guy who arrived at the Big Time. A life of fortune and fame and stuff. Yes. Yeah, yeah glamour and fame and all of that. So it was, oh, that's my song. I needed to Patrick, you work it out and so forth and so on. So Patrick worked it out. And, uh, uh, this is 1979. By 1980, it was released as we made a deal for it to be the first single from the Garden of Love album. Right. right? And um, uh, we arranged for Rick James and Patrick to, for Patrick to co-produce it with Rick James and take it out. They took the, the, the multi-track out to California where Rick James added his flavor to it. The right. entire song, the change and everything like that, uh, that was written, composed by me, and Rick James added his elements to it. But essentially, uh, he replayed the bass, took James Calloway off and replayed the bass, uh, replayed some of the piano parts, put his horns on it and so forth, and then added the don't do 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 Right. Yeah, that little... Um, and I'd like to think, I don't want to be presumptuous, but this is before Super Freak and all of that. And yes. I'd like to think that Big Time was central in reviving Rick's career to such a degree that he was able to then take that model and create new songs from it, right? And that gave you the Super Freak and the other yes. song. That's exactly what it did. But that piano intro yeah. is such an un Rick James sounding thing that I was like, it just felt like, I in my mind, I'm, I felt like, oh, at the last minute, let's add that piano intro at the top and then. <laughs> no, but that was the whole record when we, when we did it. That was, that was, you know, that was the whole demo. So I guess I really became familiar with you. Um. Kind of in the summer of 84 when like B-Boy culture's starting to set off and the Aleem's release yourself. What 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 was your thoughts on the Marley Mar remix of that song? Um I didn't know who Marley was before that, but I certainly got to know who he was since he did it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Because see, for me it became a practical situation uh that part that goes release yourself re, 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 right and an octave from where i'm singing it now right right perform that all right you might, might be able to do that once or twice all right before your whole voice would break and give half. out right yeah that's breaking half so i always was like while i understand the virtue of it being sampled, a lot of people expected it to be sung. That's why, that that was my second question. How much of a nightmare was it for them? Because that's the only version we played. I, we know there's other versions of the song, 
But we would always go to the B side and play the Molly Mall version. Right, right, right. And it was inescapable in the summer of 1984. Right. So I arrived at um at a, a balance between when I'm doing my live show, I let uh one of the girls or something like that do those parts. Right. And then <laughs> okay. I I stick to you got to, you know you need to. I stick to that. Right, mm -hmm. which makes it easy because believe me, if I just did one full chorus of that, someone's that, losing their voice. That's the end of the show. <laughs> that's the, and thank you very much. For good night, and I hope you enjoyed that 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 chorus that I just did. Yeah. I wanted to ask you, uh, Leroy. There's a record you did uh, some couple years back uh, with Glenn Underground. That let me know you're feeling me. Record. Oh yes, Patrick <sighs> Evans and myself and Glenn. Oh, oh, Patrick worked on that as well. Yes, yes. The, the song was composed by Patrick, Glenn, and myself. Uh, wow. That was uh, when um, a guy named Radic, who runs Dust Tracks Records out of Chicago, uh, he had a hookup with Glenn, and Glenn had asked for myself and Patrick. Radic con convinced us to take a plane and fly out there for a couple of days and work with Glenn. And... Uh, Again, that song was started from scratch. We had nothing, mm -hmm. no, no beat, no anything. And Patrick came up with the with with a bass line that kind of took us somewhere. And then I said I added some chords to it. And then we had Glenn come in, put the drums against it, and so forth and so on. And we began to build a record uh, uh, up from there. Uh, and within two days, we had that that song. I love that song, man. I just, I was, I was so happy. Uh, a good buddy of mine, uh, Scorp, out of uh, out of Chicago, he sent me that when it came out, and um, I was just so happy to hear you, like seeing you again, and like I, I just really love that record, man. Did you ever work with Alan George or Fred McFarlane? Because even if your name is not on the credits, I still insist that you had something to do with somebody else's guy. <laughs> even though you know your only connection to it was working with 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 jocelyn brown in inner life but and i'm not want to be starting something but <laughs> <laughs> i i can't be the only human being that thought that you produced that well alan george and fred mcfarlane well, first of all fred mcfarlane was a member of conversion and law Right. Okay. Yeah. Keyboard player for my group, you one one of the high keyboard players for the group. So we knew Fred and, and we'd known Alan because Alan had been close friends with our second the second Black Ivory band, Stone Love. So we knew Alan through that. Uh uh the reason why you hear a connection between somebody else's guy and music that you associate with me is two reasons. One is James Calloway. He's the bass player on that record, right? All right. Right. And, and of course, Fred McFarlane. And the second element is uh, George Ellington and Vincent Henry on brass. Because George and Vincent, George was a, the horn player for my band. Vincent mm. was his man. And, and the two of them, gave you that that kind of sound all right so between James and Al, um between James James Fred and and Vincent and George that's where you get that that layer of sound that compared to what we do I see all right yeah you can throw you can probably throw uh uh what the seventh heaven on that too like Gwen Guthrie it kind of dude all the literally yeah. <laughs> like <laughs> believe it or not that's the first place i looked like and i was like wait a minute what but to me it's it's your sound i i guess now that you know i guess in general in in, in wrapping this up unless you have another one fonte do you, do you uh, have any well yeah i just wanted to uh, talk to him uh about his his, his newest record um yes so, uh, yeah uh you work with a lot of my heroes on this one with the remixes. Uh, big ups to um, uh, Josh Milan and uh, Mark Mack 
from for a hero um what's your connection with with those guys and uh talk about your your work with them um everybody on um that i'm blessed to have uh shared their brilliance on these days the remixes uh have been friends for a little while now uh stacy kid i met uh a few years ago uh uh, when I invited him to uh, Paris to come see my myself and my live band perform, I've known um, Louis Vega mm-hmm. ever yeah. Vega, all the way back to the conversion remake in 2016. Um, Kenny Carpenter, good friend of mine that I worked with a song on him called More Love, and he came back and did some of the early mixes on a uh, remake that I did of Jesus Children of America by Stevie. Mm-hmm. Um, Mark Mack is a is a friend, very long time friend. I've known him for about a good 20, 25 years. Uh, it was Des Parks. I was about to say Des Parks, man. Oh my God, rest in peace. Our dear departed and ascended angel, Des Parks, who insisted on me meeting Mark, right, and said Mark is the guy. Mark is Mark, and and Mark has since I've met him and since I've worked with him. Everything that Mark has done has been just the absolute truth, just so pure. So to wrap up the whole album uh, and reflex, Nicholas, yeah. it, he was a surprise because uh, he heard these days the album, the initial album from which the remix album is inspired. Um, and he heard the song all together. And he was just really taken with that. And I was taken with all of the reflex remixes. He's the one who does the best remixing that I've heard. When I heard him do um, Rock With Me, Rock With You by Michael Jackson and All Night Long by Lionel Richie, he does his thing. Uh, In the Stone with Earth, Wind and Fire. Uh, uh, He's really a brilliant, Nicholas is really a brilliant remixer. So I was blessed that all of them, when they heard these days, the initial album come out, they called me up and they said, hey, I want to remix this and I want to remix that. And I want to do this and I want to do that. And I spoke with my partner, PL Sweets, and he said, well, let's do a remix album, uh, uh, you know, that just features remixes. Mm-hmm. Right? And that's where this latest project came. Uh, the These Days initial album was released back in September 2021. I mean, 2022. And the remix album just, it was initially released in March 23rd, 2023. And then uh, uh, as of last Thursday, it hit track source. Uh, so, and now people are starting to really get into it. But um, those guys blessed me with their talent and with their insight and with their genius. And uh, they made it into a project that I can really, really be proud of. Yeah, no, nah, we're all disciples, man. We're all disciples. I, I got one more record to ask before we wrap. Eddie Kendricks is uh, his Arista period. And you worked on the Something More record that I never used to dance. Can you talk about what, like, working with Eddie Kendricks, like, what it, what it was like? <laughs> it was a lot of fun uh, because uh, uh, Eddie Eddie is a, 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 cannabis, a cannabis indulger as I am. Yes, and uh, hey so, the club, amen. <laughs> so, um, uh, Patrick got the deal when Eddie when and when um, he was working with Arista, and mm-hmm. he said, I, I got the Eddie Kendrick deal. I said, Oh, great, that's cool. Do you have anything for him? Not really, we don't have nothing, but I'd like to meet him. So, Patrick said, Oh, come on down, I'll have a meeting with him, so forth and so on. So I bought my team, me, James, and Sonny. We went down there. We met, you know, chopped it up, had a few drinks and so forth and so on. And I was like, well, Eddie, what do you want to sing about? Right? And uh, he said, I don't really know. I don't really care. Just write me a great song. I said, "Um, for whatever reason, we started talking about the Temptations moves and and the choreography and so forth. And I, I think I started talking about how Black Eye, we, we was biting his choreography. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, so I started talking about that. And he said, well, I never liked the dancing. He said, I'm not a dancer. 
I'm a, <laughs> I'm I'm not a dancer. I'm a singer. Uh, and so although I had to do it because it was part of my my duties as a temptation, you know, to do the choreography and all of that, but I never really liked it. And I was like, wow, there's our song story. So myself and my cousin Sonny and my, my brother James, we created a song called I Never Used to never Dance, used to dance. About, which is about a dude who doesn't really like dancing. You know how many, you go to a party and you see the dudes standing up against the wall while the chicks get out. You know, they out there doing their thing and the dudes are just like standing there looking at yeah, yeah. How about that? How about the Mets? You know, right? <laughs> the Wallflower song. Yeah, yeah. So they they're doing that, but never used to dance is about that one chick that you see hit the floor, and oh my God, I just got to dance with her, and all of a sudden you're not dancing behind, <laughs> you're not dancing there, and find yourself out on the floor with this. <laughs> chick, she's the one that gets you to do it. So that's what never used to dance is all about. Wow. And he heard it when he heard it. It was like, "Oh, that's perfect. That's me. All of, that's me. <laughs> that's it." <laughs> so, so, uh, and for me, listen. When I was thirteen, fourteen, I was singing just my imagination. Wow! And and, Full way, and, and the way you do the things you do, and 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 um, um, those songs were just ingrained in me to be working with an icon like him, right? Uh, uh, and, and for him to be doing one of my compositions, one of my co-productions uh, was just a dream come true of many, many dreams that have come true in, in, in my time in, in this industry. Yo, man, this is, this is some of the best two hours ever. Yeah, we've been waiting just, on this one, man. <laughs> just nerding <laughs> out. Um, like, thank you, man. I, I, I can't even, I can't even thank you enough for this. Like, you know, you you've changed culture, and you know, you can't, you know, the, there there aren't enough flowers in the world to give you, man. Like, like yeah. what you've done for dance culture, man, is like real heads know, and uh, we just thank you for for doing our show with us. And uh, thank you for the music, man. Just your music yeah, has brought so much joy to like to my life. You know what I mean? And uh always a good time. So uh just just thank you for all your your contributions, man. Straight up. God bless y'all and thank y'all for having me. Um I'm I'm very aware of how successful your work is, Quest and this team is. Um I'm just happy to be a part of it. Uh uh, and happy to participate in this. Uh, you guys had some really great questions, man. You know, fans. <laughs> we are fans. I'm, you yeah. know, I'm a DJ, so I'm only as good as the knowledge I have of, you know, the the records I, I gravitate towards. And, mm -hmm. you know, your your records have saved many of many a party of mine. So thank you very much <laughs> for that. That's what's up. That's what's up. Thank you. Yo, on behalf of Sugar Steve and Unpaid Bill. And Fontigolo and Laia, this is another, another classic Questlove extravaganza of an interview. <laughs> we will see y'all next time. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm.